This session is brought to you by Zurich Life and Investments. These guys are one of the last true independent life insurers going around and they're Swiss, so you know their stuff is solid. These guys really understand and believe in the value of advice, which is why they invest in programs like this one and partner with groups like XY Advisor to help drive the positive evolution of financial advice in Australia. Their team are just really good people as well. So if you haven't already connected with them to learn more, check out their website or speak to your business development contact. This session is also brought to you by Sun Super. They're one of the fastest growing profit for members or industry funds in Australia. They were the very first of these funds to partner with advisors and they've got functionality where you can actually link to your client's Sun Super accounts and charge advice fees through the fund, as well as a number of uh, tech innovations to make it easier for you to work with your clients. They've got great investments, they're really, really cheap, and their team are just generally legends. So if you haven't already connected with Sun Super, give them a shout, because they're doing some really cool stuff. Andy. Andy Marshall. <laughs> Hello, boys, how are we? <laughs> Mate, Pretty good. Welcome. welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This is, um, this is very exciting. Just to be sitting down with you guys for a start, so. Mate, great, great to have you here. Reunion. It's a bit yeah. of a reunion. It has it's, been a while. Yes. It's been a while. Too long. Too long, some It's 2015, I think, was ah. the XY Modern, Modern Advisor. Advisor event. Oh, yeah. What was it? Mocha Chocolino or something? Was it? That someone hacked your um, thing? Oh. You're telling that story and they took your phone and then it's like they set up an online <laughs> dating profile <laughs> calling right. you Mocha, Mocha Chino? <laughs> That was, it was something to make a magic, I think, or something like that. <laughs> I'm really so thrilled that we started with this as, <laughs> as the introduction. No, that was gold, mate. Yeah. True so, story. It was a true story, actually. So, yeah, a, bit, that... a bit's happened in your world since since then. It's been um, nothing. Certainly hasn't been dull. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's been a couple of uh, job changes, which has been really interesting. That stretched the brain. Um, I got married. Congratulations. Which, thank you very much. That yes. was pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's, it's all about that sort of embracing, embracing what comes your way. And um, so certainly that's, it's been a couple of years, I guess, if you look back to that Modern Advisor event and uh, look forward, it's been a couple of years of embracing anything that's sort of come, come my way. And uh, it's been a hell of a lot of fun as well. Awesome, mate. So you were telling me just just before you've been chatting to a lot of advisors recently. What sort of um, what sort of things are you you hearing out there? Well, I think this is the best thing about this new role is that um, it's taken me outside of the the office building, which was driving me insane, and it's it's <laughs> it's getting me back to what I love doing, which is um, sitting with advisors every day, and uh, that's been the most exciting part. And I think particularly the last six months of just sitting in an advisor's office and understanding how much the regulatory change does impact them on a day-to-day -day basis, how much time they actually are spending on engaging with clients and particularly navigating, for want of a better expression, the, the psychology of the whole process, but then the inefficiencies they have in their business. And so most of the discussions with advisors have been about we know our process works in terms of our connection with the client, but how do we make this more efficient? So a lot of that's been solving for that. It's been saying, well, how can we bring you great ideas on efficiency? And so when you do see things like particularly the ideas that talked about in the XY forums, you know, this is the side of the type of things you want to take back out into the field, but also encourage mm. them encourage them to start networking in those types of forums because that's where the ideas are. And then the other thing you that was I've really realised is um, how isolated some advisors feel. Yeah, and you mentioned before that uh, that a lot of the feedback you were getting from from advisors was saying that they wanted to be hearing from other advisors and best of breed, right? Yeah, peer groups, uh, networking. If I look at the advisors now who are wanting to join in with me and the proposition that I've got at the moment in terms of uh, providing services to self-licensed advisors, one of the biggest draw cards is how robust is your peer-to-peer, -peer, your networking, how, mm. often can, how often can we get together? And that's it been, you know, forget all the tools and everything else and the, the commoditized services. It's how strong is that network and, and what people do you have in that network? 
and yep. we've had people come to some of our events to test out um, and in, in a really wonderful, humble way, some of these advisors are saying, I just want to see if I fit in. And it's not to say, oh, well, I don't want to see if there's a bunch of idiots that you've got um, <laughs> <laughs> that you bring to your events. But it's more to say, I, I want to contribute to He's your about community. The advisor, no, no. <laughs> That's only with you there, mate. There's, there's definitely uh, one in in particular. Yeah, there are events. some policies I hear about that. But um, <laughs> no, it's, it's really this, this humility that advisors have about... Um, wanting to contribute and so they really want to make sure that uh, the ilk and their ilk and their speciality can actually make a contribution to the network they get involved in so incredibly yeah. important yeah. yeah and i think we were just chatting about that before and uh really that's sort of where the the xy advisor group all started like i remember uh clayton and i used to work together at Dixon's, then he worked with Patty in Horizons, and uh, Clay started his business. I was at a small business, sort of building out the financial advice arm, and w- like I was massively out of my depth. Clay uh, definitely was as well. Still, <laughs> still is, still is to be fair. Um, in yeah, pretty much everything. But um, we would just we would just come up with some stuff, and I had a, a mentor who was helping me out, and 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 us speak to different advisors, and we'd adjust our service offering or the way that we'd engage someone, and then Clay would enhance it a bit, then I'd hear what he was doing, then try and enhance it a bit more, and I think that 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 peer uh, knowledge, especially, like it works, like when you're when you've got experience and you're working on new things, but also when you're when you're building that experience as well, so no better way to learning and I think that that's where that, that's why the community is so important and you tend to underestimate like you look at the journey that you've been on <laughs> but I look at some advisors who have been in the business for years and for all intensive purposes you'd look at their their process and their clients and their, even their book you know however you want to measure a business and they're struggling with you know how do I actually stay relevant um, particularly with a modern thinking client because things have changed so dramatically in the way that people do business and so some of the best ideas they're saying you know they don't want to sit in a room with experienced advisors and I'm talking you know very long dated experience and and that wisdom certainly has a place but they want to look at who is moving forward with ideas Mm. and so that can come from anyone because anyone can be a a forward thinker yeah Um, so the diversity of uh age, if you like, is is really broad in the advisors that I'm seeking in the community. Um, and interestingly, interesting, a lot of, lot of uh, female advisors, really strong mm. female advisors who have this really wonderful contribution that they're making into the community at the moment. And so some of the most vocal voices and forward thinking advisors um, are the, the strong females we've got in the community as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So it's really, really great to see. Well, we had Peter uh, Diamantides as the uh, as the host of the last event here in, in Sydney, and um, her, her her mastery of not just financial advice, but we're also talking about startup stuff. You know, she's ex actuary, ex you know investment bank investment uh, banker. You know, and 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 when she says something, it comes from this place of authority but because she's so lovely as well comes across you know it, it, I, I learn every time I speak to her absolutely mm. yeah and there's some amazing female advisors out there I think that uh, in a lot of cases that emotional intelligence and um, oh, yeah. and empathy and, and coaching with clients sometimes comes a little easier to them almost mm. or, or they're certainly um, yeah. yeah like do, doing well on 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 that side of the ledger and I think that that's getting more and more important that we're mm. seeing with more and more technology sort of uh, being able to automate things that uh, yeah I think I think it's great yeah, it's, it's uh, strangely enough it's the female advice <laughs> strengths that are now almost becoming financial advice whereas the the typical uh, you know in the past where it was far more uh, male orientated that stuff is getting uh, automated that's yeah. quite quite funny well, isn't the, it? I Which suppose another angle is probably the sales process becoming more subtle mm. it's not as um, like that old school book calling is well, more diminishing value-driven. a little bit yeah it's a lot more value driven it's a lot more um, sort of touch points and not necessarily as sort of um, I guess brute influence. force brute force yeah no, you might no. say for some of the yeah, this concept of the advice process, I, 
I, I do struggle with this because I can see both sides. So my go-to position always is let's talk and engage about values and goals and let's match and keep coming back in the strategy and in the subsequent years coming back to those values and so the decisions that we make are congruent with those values that are guiding what we want. Uh, then I look at the propositions that have always been around investments and mm. investment performance and people have built businesses on this and their reviews, you wouldn't talk about values, you'd be talking about where the portfolio has gone. And I, I look at it and go, that's really so one-dimensional and mm. we should be having this values conversation. But I try to go, well, what do actually people want? And do we go too far with values and goals and warm hugs and lose sight? <laughs> yeah, lose sight of, of, well, hang on, by the way, the, por- advisors. Yeah, the portfolio has to actually perform. And yes. so trying to find that balance, so I can see it from both points of view, but my everything that I've, I've seen and researched and you see all these different models, it, it is moving towards, well, anyone or anything. That algorithm can produce mm. that portfolio. Yeah. Whether or not that's relevant to your circumstances is the beauty of the discussion with the advisor, mm. that face-to-face engagement and really knowing someone and, and knowing what they want to do and being able to track it in a manner which they understand in... Mm in the efficiencies and process, et cetera, that they are really comfortable with. And, and that's what I see being the new frontier. Actually, for how, how do you track a value? How do you track that? That's, that's really interesting. I, I, that's a great question because it's, you, you can change. And as you get older, our values will change yeah. uh, as one definition. Although I, I'm very cautious of saying just because you're getting older, you're getting wiser. It's not actually the case. <laughs> it's definitely not the case. You think some people go the other Damn direction. It. It's, well, it's actually, I was banking on that. No, no. Sadly, I can tell you it's about 3% of what wisdom actually is. Oh, so age is... I've got no hope then. So the rest of it in terms of tracking, yeah, in terms of tracking it, it is it is life experience is a huge part of it. That's about 20%. You've got mm. your psychology of your personality, uh, your, so your personality traits, the way you learn, and how also, many percents that? That's all in about the twenties. Oh, oh okay. yeah, twenties. Oh, and then your <laughs> high twenties, so, <laughs> so even more trouble. Uh, but then you've also got uh, your crystallized intelligence, and so those things. When you look at that, so you look at what the journey of an advisor is. Is the life experience is something that is somewhat of a constant and very client driven. But in terms of the crystallized intelligence piece, that's such a significant piece. So if an advisor can work with a client and continue their literacy, but also their financial literacy, but also how that impacts on their life situation, which then in turn enhances their social activity, mm. uh, their their personality, the groups, the types of life experiences that they then have. The value of the advisor is in that sort of chain there because mm. you, by creating financial strategies that are congruent with the current values, then they get to shift and move along that journey that you have with the client. So you can track it. You can So you go saying back one of revisit. the core, core pieces of an advisor proposition is their personal life experience. Well, we help them get Ooh, more, more life experience uh, well, or like think, different different sorts think, of experience. I think Patty's talking about the advisor's life yeah. experience. I yeah. think the sharing oh, yeah. of a life experience, the sharing of what you are doing in your life, but also most importantly, because depending on the experience of an advisor, you know, perhaps that life experience is condensed relative to the client that you're sitting in front of. Mm. But if you can share life experiences of clients that you've helped, then your depth of knowledge becomes incredibly broad mm. because they're sitting there and the client is sitting there in their own little world in terms of and has their relative blinkers on with some exposure, obviously, to their social circle. But then if you are giving them stories of how others like them peer-to-peer, so where am I relative to my peers? That's, I think, the value of an advisor is that you have this broad lens. And that's the same in my role. You know, I I go into an advisor's office and an advisor says, hey, Andy, you see different advisors every day. Tell me what they're doing. 
It's the same thing. It's, Do I you think just it's the tell them thing. to, to uh, join the XY Advisor Facebook group? No, I haven't done that? it for a while, but um, <laughs> please give me give me a link and I'll, I'll, I'll gladly pass it on. I'll put it on my email signature. <laughs> Thanks, we can mate. try Got that. Got our back. Got our back. <laughs> so is that like it's we were able like that so that um I guess angles that we're leverage we're able to leverage off our client base and the more clients we deal with the more people we get experience through their sharing with us we can then share with other clients is it ah oh, i completely believe that mm-hmm. because i used to believe it that you could go around this really scientifically and mm. i still remember that when oh god i'm going to tell go off on a massive tangent now so go that's on okay. do it do it <laughs> Okay, this is going to be a little le- little left of centre, but when um, when Pfizer took over Warner Lambert, now the boys are looking at me going, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> when Pfizer took over Warner Lambert, they had this uh, product menu as, as long as your arm. It was huge. So they had to do some rationalisation. And so they said, how are we going to do this? And they looked at the whole angle was defensible therapeutic claims. And you've all heard of these because it was like Listerine is more effective than... Brushing, brushing and flossing alone, Benadryl reduces coughs after a certain period of time. So if you looked at your... I used to think that if you looked at your client base, what were the defensible claims you could make about the achievements that you'd done? Right. So you could say 70% of my clients have XYZ assets in their self-managed super fund, whatever it is. Or you could survey, you know... 90% of my clients are happier than the average client. You know, whatever it is, you can make these defensible claims. And that was adding some sort of science to it. I think I've evolved that proposition now to say, well, actually, it's all about what life experiences these people are having. What are they achieving? What are the mm. sorts of things that they're going through? So if I was looking at a young couple with kids and all the stresses that they have in daily life, you can say, that's okay. You know, that's not dissimilar to all the other types of clients I help. And this is a particular type of client I helped just recently and this is what we did for them. This is how they're feeling about it. And suddenly you get that breaking down of barriers because you've shared a story that is re- really relevant in their world. Yeah. And I think some of the most successful financial planning businesses around the globe are really just great at telling and sharing stories. Rather um, than having a, a, a massive investment option list. Oh, absolutely. And it's they've been their ability to their ability to attract to clients is absolutely in direct proportion to how well they've been able to tell stories. Mm. Um, New York yeah. Life is a is a fantastic example of that because they do this all the time. They totally rejigged their communication uh, methodology a few years back and it was all about what stories for the types of clients that we want to attract have meaning and relevance. And that was it. So, you know, most advisors I see do this well, do this naturally. Mm. Yeah, and I think it makes it so much easier for people to engage when they can hear analogies that are sort of relevant to a client's circumstances, whether, whether it's one about an element of the advice that you're talking about or, or en masse with, um, you know, uh, providing stories that people can, can sort of connect with. Uh, but it, it, I think it, people want to hear stories of other people that are in similar situations to them or have struggled with the same things because it makes it easier for them to to relate to as well. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think, you know, interesting point you made about the uh, the, the the sort of uh, elements of advice and what, is, what it is that people are valuing because we're, we're definitely seeing this massive shift towards the more, the broader sort of values-based um, goal, well, goals-based and values-based, but objectives-based advice, um, uh, coaching and, and, and the accountability side. But I think that there's still that, that, um, that those people that want transactional or the more transactional or the more sort of individual sort of piece advice around, say, an investment management or setting up some insurance or, 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 you know, the, the, the smaller sort of pieces. Piece. Yeah. But I think that, maybe with more 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 technology over time that that will that will be automated and and reduced interested in your thoughts on that i think that piece really needs to be the focus of the investment houses the insurance houses is how do you make this easier like a hell of a lot easier how do you make this really because if you're sitting there and you've done all of this work with the client and we know where they want to go why do we have to have such a long drawn out process mm. to one not only implement a solution 
but then also to to track or or report on that solution and for me that's the failing of 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 software in terms of why can't I get with a push of a button instantaneously mobile enabled really just snapshot on where my world is and I know there's all these there are some great fintechs out there who have parts of that equation solved but it's how do you get that all in an ecosystem that is really there at the touch of an advisor's fingers well that's actually a great segue into um if, if you hadn't heard andy marshall's worked with the fpa and ben martian on uh, a fintech white paper mm. and did a great job did an awesome job i was talking to ben he was stoked you're on board and uh it, there's a lot of good um, avenues you guys can take it in the future you you came across you would have been exposed to a whole lot of fintechs and doing all sorts of things and were there any particular insights that popped out that are things that you didn't think you were going to see there i was surprised that with the number of fintechs in inverted commas that are out there how few were actually really, really relevant to the advice process efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And you came back to that usual suspects type of list. And and sure, look, there's about, I would say, there's about 30 that I think of. Oh, these are amazing because they can all fit into your website. They can be white labeled. They can all provide an efficiency across the spectrum of the advice process. For me, it was about how do they connect? And I think the... The biggest challenge that I saw was, okay, when you look at who am I using for the process of financial advice and delivering that statement of advice, how do we get these pieces talking to that functional um, foundation block of my advice process? And I, I, I guess I came to the, the point where I was like, are these software solutions that we have to spit out an SOA, are they just a power planning tool? And therefore, we can really outsource that. And shouldn't the focus be on what's the front end engagement tool that captures all the relevant information and ultimately feeds it into this power planning tool. Mm. But the main game is at the front end of the engagement. Mm. So that's where certain fintechs really stood out because for me they were like this is where they're collecting the data they're really highly engaging for the client to to do as well they're easy for the advisor to manage there's a bit of to and fro there's collaboration and it's all mobile enabled and ultimately that data and that richness goes into the crm whatever that may be whatever your weapon choice is but they were the ones that really interested me it was the ones that 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 basically delivered the ability for an advisor to connect quicker with a client. Yeah, I like that. Weapons of advice. <laughs> weapons of choice. Yeah, <laughs> choose your weapons choice. carefully. <laughs> well, I like the concept, and you've sort of talked about it a few times, of tracking or like a roadmap yeah. and where where client currently sits on their their life plan uh, on you know with values. Uh, ob objectives rather in the same way that we track investments why is there no piece of software out there that's saying right for these uh, non-monetary things that you wanted to achieve you've achieved x you've achieved y z we're still working on um you're right i i don't know of any piece of software that that's that's doing uh, i wouldn't even really know how to capture like i guess if i was to think about it operationally would that be something along the lines of there is a piece of software that sort of uh, touches base with the client on a on a, a regular or semi-regular basis how are you feeling about xyz how are you do you feel like you've achieved uh, this this type of thing you know or, almost like maybe a weekly or or a fortnightly uh, text message you know uh, green or red uh, as yes or no, you you uh, you feel like you're doing better at your job, something like that, and then tracking all of these things that that the person is happy to to belong with, automate as much as possible, and then come you know either monthly catch up, six monthly catch up, annual catch up, whatever it is, give some reporting on that because 
Um, that's some really cool stuff. I've never heard it before. The closest thing I've ever heard to that type of stuff is, and I tried to do it for about six months and I, I, I gave up after a while. And this is just a personal thing, but writing small little notes to myself about things that I was happy about or that I had achieved or or that I was thankful for, actually. That's probably the, the best term for it. Things that I was thankful for and then just putting them away. Um, and then, you know, just pulling them out maybe uh, once every six months or something and saying, oh, wow, you're right. I'm, I'm thankful for all of these things that happen because I don't feel that good all the time every day. And it's good to say, oh, thank God. Um, over the last six months, at least I've got I've got these things that I, I don't carry at the forefront of my mind. And so that's a very manual thing and I was just doing it for myself. But the way that you're talking is almost sort of digitalati- digitalati- digitizing that and then reporting upon that. I've never heard that before and it sounds pretty cool. We've really moved into the warm hug territory, haven't we? It's like very, very quickly. Dear Clayton, you are so pretty today. <laughs> Part of that my, was at least one. A, Just admit it. A, that was at least one a, of the notes. A part of my financial planning process is you get 10 hugs a year. <laughs> Not a bad proposition. I think that's got validity. But actually what you've just described is very much software that's going to be coming. Wow. And there is some of this elements here. I have seen individual advisors build this. So they have client portals where there is a basic timeline which has some goals in there, and usually those goals are depicted in, in a visual sense. And clients come in and can move the sliders along. And so when they've done that, then the advisor obviously is alerted to it. But, of course, that's still a manual process. The client's got to come in, they've got to update something, then the advisor gets some sort of notification, then has to come back, etc., etc. So it's only as powerful as the willingness and ability of the client to get into the portal and the advisor then to react to it. Yeah. What is coming and what I really love about this is you can predetermine some type of icons, etc., which have some meaning. So the mm. heart could be about family. So there's the heart icon as an example. And you can then also map cash flow. You can then place those icons on that cash flow map. You can do all your different modellings and what-if scenarios on, well, what about if we got this investment return or what if you didn't have income protection insurance and this happened, there was a scenario here. And the cash flow changes, but also those milestones in terms of values, etc. So whether that's a travel or whether that's family, starting a family, what have you, they're all changeable as well. So you get that and then you get this cheering from the sidelines in inverted commas. And that is where you get the digitization off because your cash flows are into or input into that model, because there's some goal tracking as well, this app can then shout from the sidelines and say, well done, you've made you've done this this week. Whatever those different goals are, you can set it up and somehow track them in, in that way. So you're getting tracking from the sideline. It looks as if you as the advisor has sent that that little cheer. Right. So then you're getting this constant collaboration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're not having, so it's much easier for the client because everything's automatic. So they don't have to log into a portal and input some, um, some information. So A, they'll do it more often. It's sitting on their phone, on their mobile device. So it's, they don't really have to think about it, but they're getting these enormous notifications. So just as, you know, I saw my um, video from Facebook about my year, um, which I haven't, post- <laughs> I haven't posted yet. I was, there's a couple of people left out of the video, so I might have to, I don't know how you can doctor that. Can you ask them to edit it? Yeah, I don't know if you can ask them to edit it, but, but it, it, you look at something like that, that's automatically done for you. Mm. There's really similar mm. type mm. of concepts. So mm. that is so close, so close to coming. Mm. And that for me is the tipping point in terms of what we were talking about before with all these different pieces of fintech that some talk to each other, some don't, some we have to put a Band-Aid on top to get them to talk to each other and create the ecosystem for ourselves. Think of all of that now packaged up in something that works in the manner in which people are consuming information on an everyday basis. And that's so close. So so the outcome's still going to be the same, but it's how much are they going to invest in our model portfolio? What? 
ultimately. Wait, is that a joke? I just, I can never tell with you if, whether, you're on, whether, you're on, whether you're on track or not. Well, you know, you know what? He makes a good point because ultimately at the end of the day, what are we, life coaches or we're financial advisors? We've yeah, got to build, totally. up, build up some assets at some point in time. So the time you may have spent on constructing a portfolio the time you may have spent on tracking the returns. If that's all automated, then what it is is ultimately saying, and through all of this and all of these things that you want to achieve and the cash flows that you have here, we apply this solution and the probability of of making all of these is at 95%. And being able to instantly see a snapshot and for the client to be able to see that snapshot at any point in time, Mm. real live data, so it's today it's 93, tomorrow it's 97, whatever the percentage is. For them yeah. to see that all the time and to have a digital, really digital and live SOA, right? that's, that's what's coming. And I so for me, that's the massive tick. I think it has to be scaled though, like you're talking about that, the goals tracking piece and uh, we were chatting earlier about you know increasing cost to serve and the requirements on advisors from a business level, a regulatory level and, um, you know, the... the the focus being more on the on the digital side and it's great to have all these tools and trackers but i think yeah it has to be easy for the client but it also has to be easy for the for the advice business as well otherwise it's not going to work if it's too onerous because it, that's it's great but if you're talking about engaging more people at scale then it, you can't be spending all your time tracking hard icons and goal trackers right no it has to be automated and i, I think you know the difficulty for people now you know we want to spend time on the relationship but if it's still taking us 20 hours to produce a piece of advice yeah then the limit on the number of clients we can serve and, and whether you take that the jerry mcguire model of you know less clients deeper relationships etc cetera, etc cetera, you know what is the ideal model and um, how many clients could i manage and i've always worked under that that um belief that you know the more clients i can help as an advisor then the greater quality of life outcomes we have for this amazing group of people and if that was 300 for argument's sake and then the flow on impact that they have i mean this is part of the reason why i ultimately loved being in distribution in from a product point of view because as an advisor having 300 which was probably you guys might say that's at the upper end you know how can you manage that well, by working bloody long hours and probably being incredibly inefficient. I remember when they did a benchmarking, um, one of the houses did a, a benchmarking of my business and they said, you have one of the most profitable businesses in terms of the, the revenue that you generate, nice. but you spend more time. Mm. And so actually when you do factor that out, your margin's not that great because mm. you spend more time than anyone else. So you're living and dying by clients. And so certainly that wasn't, uh, a, a model that had a lot of longevity with it because you're going to get burnt out at some point. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, how do you make that more efficient in, in terms of that aut- automation of those types of things, which are the, the fundamentals, the ticker box saying, this is what we deliver and here's your report, but spending more time on the relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what, and so you're, you're obviously you're talking to a lot of advisors. What are you seeing as the biggest challenges that uh, with the advice businesses that you're talking to? I think keeping up with things. I think absolutely keeping up. You know, regulatory. It, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Regulatory, um, and the process of delivering the piece of advice. Mm. Uh, like that, functionally getting down to those. What's the new piece of legislation or yada yada. Yeah, yada. the inter, inter, interpretation. I think of the legislation. Well, it's, there's two levels, isn't there? Yeah, got, it is. What you've is got it? What the regulator says, and then what your dealer group interprets it as. Yeah, what it is. How is it interpreted? How does that impact on me? Does that mean my advice documents need to change in some way, shape, or form? And then, therefore, how does that impact on the efficiency of me producing? How frustrating is that? (laughs) Considering what advisors should be focusing on, and and now we're focusing on oh, don't forget to add this two sentence of standard text on page thirty five. Right, that seems absurd. But it's just that you know, I think that no deal- one's ever going to read. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd like to think people read it. <laughs> I, maybe I'm a blind optimist. Yeah, I've um, got a client that flipped to page fifty-two to see that. <laughs> just to see. <laughs> oh, you included it. Good. I highlighted it because we went to so much effort to put it in there. <laughs> oh, look, and that's that's why you know, 
when you see example statements of advice produced, and obviously there's one been out recently, I, I look at it and go, you know, it's so counterintuitive to... This is the ASIC one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, you know, and, and kudos to them for actually trying to put something out there and for trying to give direction, and I think a lot of that direction is needed. However, I always look at it and say, you know, would someone read, understand and want to consume this piece? Mm. And I, I always look at it and say, you know, the, going down to the core of what it is that you're doing, is there a need for repetition? No, there's not. You know, how can we mm. make this user-friendly? So, and not wanting to dumb it down because, you know, the value of what advisors do is, is navigating something which, which people find incredibly complex. And, and, and it, the ASIC's own data talks about about 50% of people find it, f dealing with their finances, really interesting and something they need to do, yep. but incredibly stressful. Yep. And the really sad piece of data that they had from ASIC Report 413 was a quarter of people think that no matter what they do, it will make no difference mm. to their financial circumstances. That's crazy, isn't it? It, it, it makes it makes you really <clears throat> go, hang on a sec, you know, where are we living? Like, mm. it's like, that's yeah. crazy. Mm. And you you can take one view of that and say, oh, well, they're the 25% of people who, who I don't want to deal with anyway. And I think that's, that's terrible to throw mm. a whole heap of people on the scrap heap. I look at it and say, okay, what, what's the challenges here? And the challenges are, it's the complexity. So how do you make it simpler for them to consume hmm. that piece of advice? And, how do you and, make it more cost effective? And cost effective, well. but I think the the legislation is hmm. and regulatory uh, architecture that we have to navigate around is is one thing that causes uh, enormous amount of stress to the advice business. Well, it was interesting talking to Ben Marsh, and, and he's he's completely pushing for audio visual engagement through the SOA, and essentially have a digital SOA. And a lot of advisors are starting to incorporate videos by reference. Um, a lot of them are doing like PowerPoints, are quite common now. So you're starting to get that. I think a lot of people are trying to how do you how do you actually broaden um, and sort of like I personally just show the clients the bare minimum of the compliance side of things in the SOA, and then work on um, trying to explore the stuff that is actually exciting and engaging for them. And um, yeah, I think that's. The more we can move in that direction, some of these apps are probably going to be able to help in that space. A lot of this had to do with education. You know, how well does this client understand mm -hmm. the piece of advice that's been put in front of them? And, you know, if I was reviewing a file um, as a compliance person, as a pragmatic compliance person, a commercial compliance person, I'd be looking at it saying, how does this person understand the piece of advice? And where's the evidence that they actually do? And how's this piece of advice congruent with their goals and so that then leads you into saying there needs to be a really strong education piece a really strong connection piece and there needs to be a demonstration that we've really understood what their goals are and the, mm. and the client's really cognizant of that as well and typically when you review files you, you don't see that connection because <laughs> of the pieces of well, it's what been advice told is important. are required to be mm. delivered. Totally. When you talk to the advisor, on the other hand, they know this client. They mm. know everything about the client and there's this incredible richness of the story of the client. Mm. It's just not anywhere in the file. It's crazy. In the, in the required pieces of work that we've, we've got. So it's like, how do you bring that richness of that conversation through technology mm as opposed to handwriting some file notes. Well, but, even, you know, how do you bring that technology? Before? Because, like, if you think about it, we had Ellen Dartnell, um, like, she was one of the earliest people we had at one of our events, and she's got a whole education process that she does. And I think you would have had, been exposed to that when, in one of your previous roles. She is absolutely amazing. And I still... Ha I, she gave me quite a few of them. She gave me the little red books, the, the journals mm. that she has. So awesome. I, I use them. But when I was fortunate enough to sit down with her in her office and with the say-so of the clients, I was allowed to read some of the journals. Uh, that was... Um, I walked away from... I was driving back from the, the Highlands and I was on the phone um, with the AFA saying I'd just done this visit with with Eleanor and it's this is why I'm in the industry like wow that was 
mm-hmm. like how an emotional impact. Um, because I would read the journals and there was one particular journal um, which will never go out of my mind, but it was a widow who'd come in and here she was at this point of devastation and the entries in her journal were how scared she was and how little she knew about her situation. And you fast forward through the months of that work with Eleanor, and here was a person who was confident, who was really able to articulate what it was she was doing in her strategy, and that was, the for me, the power of, of the advice. And sitting in that office, um, they we just broke for lunch, and I sat down with all of her team, and I just said to her team, I said, you don't realise what you've got here. Like, you don't realise the power of what it is that you're actually doing for these clients. Mm. And, um, you know, they were so emotionally invested in the, in the lives of all their clients. But that was an amazing way to document that journey. Um, mm. So, you know, how do you take that from in, and digitise that? You know, mm. how, how does that happen? Because I think this is the conversation that all advisors do have. Mm. It's just that, you know, there's a really formal way of, of tracking it that Eleanor has, which is, you know, amazing. But what do you think the the disconnect is with, you know, you talk about sample statements of advice and the the need for things to be user friendly. Obviously, with the with the dealer services that that you guys are doing, you're seeing a lot of people with different, um, you know, self licensed business with their own sort of uh, compliance sort of approach. Um, but we still see SOAs typically, you know, in my opinion, much longer than they need to be to get the point across. Plus, still have they're missing those bits, as you say, but not clear, not not so easy to understand. Maybe better from a defensible position. But what what is the disconnect? What's stopping businesses from making it into the six-page document that you know the ASIC and the associations are, are putting out? And why do they keep it? Why do they keep it? How it, how it's been? Uh, look, I think the first thing is um, the generic text. Like, does it even need to be in there? And often that's put in there as, I, I assume, for the education piece because all it talks about is what is a managed fund, etc. Now, if that's the point that you're having that discussion, now I think you're in a bit of a problem. You're, you're in a bit of trouble. <laughs> Here's your advice. This is a managed fund. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, like I, so I'm like, well, why does it need to be there? Totally. Because if it's in there, then it's a clear demonstration. I haven't had this conversation, so I'm chucking in here and hope you read it. And... I, I would take all of that out because that's something you should have had at the front end. Totally. So suddenly you've just shortened your statement of advice by about 40 pages here already yeah. if you've got education pieces at the front. And then the really simple thing to add that connection with the client, what I have seen is advisors stick in two single pages. One talks about values and one talks about the goals that aren't some generic goals that have been spat out by the software. Yeah. So you can tell in those two pages there's the richness of the discussion and that's not hard to do. So, you know, if anything at a stretch, that might be 20 minutes that you've actually recounted your experience with this client. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I take it back to, I used to have a very laborious process, but we used to go through lifestyle questionnaires and there was a lot of things that people actually shared in those lifestyle questionnaires. We'd get them to rate certain aspects of their life. So we'd get them to rate spirituality, their abode, their their hobbies, all of these sorts of things. Mm. And we put that into the statement of advice. And the difficulty that created for us was, well, do we need to solve that? Mm. So I had a 40-year-old who put in... To send him to uh, South America uh, on a on an ayahuasca journey. <laughs> that'll solve all <laughs> spiritual... Oh. That'll max them out. <laughs> Could possibly do. <laughs> well, you could be held, you you could be held, held liable for that. <laughs> you could, yeah, 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 possibly. We've got to, go to minimize risk. And, minimize uh, risk. Take some hallucinogens. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. my general advice. advice only. General <laughs> advice. A mid- massive disclaimer on that one. <laughs> but when you got that richness of information, what do you do with it? And I think that's, you know, let's not make light. If the closer you get with a client and the closer you learn about their hopes and dreams, you do take on an incredible responsibility. Absolutely. And mm. so it, you, you're moving away. And I think that's where people have struggled with it, saying I've moved away from, I, I thought I was an investment advisor. And now you're telling mm. me I've got to ask someone about values. And I think this is where people have really struggled. Mm. And then, because then coming back to your point, and how do I put that in an SOA? Mm. Because my dealer group's given me this template and there ain't no, yeah. there's nothing in there that says this. And that's where I think the dealer groups have to look at and rationalise. Because I totally understand what they're doing. They're, they're looking at minimising risk across their network yes. for the betterment of all mm. the clients. Yes. But how do you do that in a more pragmatic way? 
Yeah. And I think that's where you need a lot of development in in amongst all of the work that you do need from your product providers, mm. providers in simplifying things as well. Yeah, I think sure. um, XY Advisors, a lot of the discussion that goes on is that interplay between exploring new avenues but then going, shit, where am I going here? What do I do? How does it fit in to this framework? And like from a dealer group, in defense of the dealer groups, the legislation focuses so hard on products that they have to focus hard on products and then that just plays out. Oh, they would focus on it regardless, even if it wasn't the the, legal, the legalities. Well, but even take... take um, so self-licensed people that you're dealing with, there's no... They can create their own APL. Like, there's no... When you're not don't have a line a line situation, you've got a complete open canvas, and they're still having to do all this stuff because that's what the legislation dictates. Yeah, agreed. So, yeah. and so Andy, what are you seeing? So they're the challenges, but what are you seeing that the the be, the best businesses or the most successful businesses? What are they doing differently? That back end, I think if you look at the three things that so there's the management of the psychology of the client, there's the dealing with the regulatory framework and then there's the strategy of running the business and what the best businesses are doing I mean the the regulations is the regulations and you just get some good advice on how you can implement that the psychology of the client which has always been my sort of go-to is have some great insights learn how to to manage the choice architecture that you've you've got there and, and and learn how to manage a client's wisdom which is just a series of great questions it's like seven or eight questions you can ask and you've got it. Mm. So then where the real work is happening and what the great businesses are doing, it's in the strategy section because the strategy section is, all right, what is the promise that I'm making to the clients and what I want to achieve and who are my target clients, the people I absolutely love dealing with? So what are the capabilities I need to build around this? And they are looking at those five, six capabilities and they're making sure that they have an ecosystem that delivers those capabilities really efficiently. So they're really looking at that part of the business. So that means straight away that things like their business premises and their marketing messages are really on point, but then it's the delivery of the piece of advice because ultimately that's what I have to give them. So how do I make sure that that is as efficient and as relevant as it can be? So yes, they are rewriting their SOAs. They've got a great education process so they don't have to have all the guff in the SOA. Um, They've got great ways of gathering data that are engaging from a client. So all of those things are, but all of those things have to stay true to the proposition. And so then these things are the capabilities that they've built. So as an example, as a live example, you know, if my capability is all about navigating you through this particular journey of life as a 30 to 45 year old, then I need to have great cash flow management systems. So let's yep. let's set up an architecture around that. Then you're more than likely going to be accumulating and debt funding. So let's look at my great solutions that I've got for you there. And that's what they're building. So it's very targeted, very focused as opposed to a retirement business, you might have some focus on how do I intertwine the aged care proposition into Well, I'm that. interested with these businesses that have, um, I guess, really understood what their proposition is. Are they going out and going, okay, well, I'm going to create this new, or well, we've identified this this area that's really valuable to the clients that we don't deliver. Are they creating it themselves or are they, and what's the thought process that you're seeing around pulling in other professionals or services? Not so much that yet. It's, you know, I think the Nirvana is creating that ecosystem not only of uh, of technology that allows you to deliver, but also what's the the architecture around the different professionals that I'll tap into. Mm. So you, you become the central hub and you've got these other professionals that are engaged. And I've seen, you know, obviously there's a few people out there talking about that type of model, mm. the likes of the Vicky Riders, et cetera, talking mm. about building that, that, that ecosystem. I haven't seen too many people doing that really mm. successfully. Um, I mean, I'll defer to your sort of knowledge in terms mm. of sort of more forward-thinking people, but I haven't seen too many really going out that way um, and creating really tight communities of, mm. of, of, of advice, but the advice that transcends anything from health and well-being through to getting a good plumber, you know. Nutrition. All that yeah, nutrition. Like, that. like, it's like that's the type of ecosystem mm. that I've seen one that of the, people one talk of the, about. One of the things I've seen a little bit of uh, recently is this concept of the of people outsourcing their life uh, it, you know cleaners uh, you know uh, er, people that run errands um, it's 
I've never heard of an advisor doing that, but it'd be very interesting to see that being a part of the process, right? Because as someone who loves to outsource things, I would still not really know how to go about, you know, offloading errands to someone. But if I had an advisor who part of their service proposition to me was they've got this list of people depending on, you know, where you live or whatever, uh, and then prompting me with questions on things that I do not necessarily have to do myself. Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden helping me implement, uh, you know, a, a strategy where people do shit for me. Uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think it's uh, having those, uh, having that network of, of people like professionals has always been important in finance. You know, you need to have a good accountant, lawyer, um, uh, you know, other people that can help with money related things. But I think more and more people want to save time and, and use a network yeah. in other areas as well. So mm. I think there's a few models. Value yeah. I think there's a few models that will emerge and you'll have your traditional and very transactional business. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Totally. Because that, that just suits um, a certain type of clientele. Mm. And then you'll have the people who will ebb and flow with advice as their life changes at periods and you will be relevant to them at different moments and you'll be relevant to them at different for different meanings. So, you know, how do you build and monetize a business out of that, I think, is, is the challenge for that type of advisor. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the future of, of advice is incredibly strong because of the different models that are emerging. Uh, the yeah. movement, the IFA movement uh, and self-licensing, I think, is, is really powerful. But I think the dealer group model has incredible relevance as well. And for the main reason, that is that is the where the vast majority of people actually consume their advice. So. Yes. Well, Andy, we could talk about this all day. I just want to give you uh, one last question before we wrap up. Uh, the Royal Commission is, is sort of on the way. What do you think it, the impact will be on the, on the industry and the different players out there? So we haven't seen terms of reference yet, have we? No. So your guess is as good as mine then in that case. I don't, look, I don't know. I think, you know, anything that investigates uh, how advice is dispensed and delivered that has as its sole focus better outcomes for consumers, Yeah. well, go for it. Spending money when it's for political reasons, or I'm not saying this is because I'm not that close to it, well, yeah, maybe that's questionable. Terms of reference out there, so who knows? I, look, I don't know. I think in the meantime, what advisors will do is just get on with the, the, the business of dispensing advice and let, let, don't let this be another distraction um, into it into what you do on an everyday basis. And I don't think, I don't think the, the major houses are, are, are concerned in terms of the day-to-day. The day-to-day for an advice business, for an insurance house, an investment house, a dealer group, the day-to-day is, is ensuring that people are getting good quality advice from their advisors. And um, I think that's the focus as everyone who works in the industry on an everyday basis. So, you know, I, I have confidence in that. And and before we wrap up, um, mate, can you please tell us about your book? Have you got any sort of, uh, you know, chatting gigs coming up i know you're like with the host extraordinaire uh, like tell it tell us a little bit about where to get your book what it's about everything like that so the book was written uh and well released in in march of uh 2017 so it has been a big year and that eventuated from a discussion with an advisor and an advisor was having trouble he would he'd been asked to go back and repitch his strategy and the first attempt at pitch pitching it he'd gone in and hit them with the beautiful strategy and structures and hadn't connected. And so when we sat down and chatted and we mapped out and I mapped out, I said, go back and repitch this way. And ultimately what we'd written on the napkins over lunch, I was like, I think there might be a book in this. And (laughs) so that's what ended up happening. So the book is, you can jump onto Amazon. Uh, If you go to amazon.com.au and you look up client engagement for financial advisors with an O, um, the American market was clearly targeted here. (laughs) So if you go there, you can download the ebook, which works on any device. There's a free app that makes it work on any device, and that's your most most cost-effective way. There is paperback. I've got to get off my bum and... um, 
order a whole bunch of paperbacks and get them across, but they are produced in the state, so it does cost you about three times as much um, to get yeah. the paperback, yeah. um, so, <laughs> which some people have found out. Um, <laughs> But that's that. I don't have, no, look, I don't have any, um, apart from what I'm doing with the self licensed businesses um, from the IWF Alliances, um, most of my, my speaking gigs will be done there. I'm, I'm keen for any 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 hosting abilities. Oh, any, please, please. Let, just give me a call. I, I, I do sit by the phone waiting for it to ring. <laughs> and, but, you know, happy to do, happy to do anything. But um, look, I, look, I just enjoy mixing with advisors and I enjoy that collaboration that you get and therefore, you know, there's no better way to do it in, in, in front of an audience and you can actually get that that instantaneous feedback about um, how strong this community is and um, how we need to keep fostering that. Yeah, definitely. Cool, mate. Well, we've got plenty lined up for this year, so uh, we'll, we'll be sure to hit you up. Uh, but thanks very much for joining us, Andy. Uh, great insights. Future of advice is strong. Mm. Cheers, oh, absolutely. Mate. Oh, pleasure. Thanks for having us. I really do appreciate it. Cheers, mate. Awesome.